Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Shuri. Um, this is great to see a full room. Uh, so I would like to thank you for coming here today and for having the courage to listen to me for a few hours. I actually don't have that courage myself. So, <laughs> um, so today there is kind of a, a, a packed schedule and I would like to give some remarks before we actually go into the actual presentations. So we've been trying to figure out um, some kind of collaboration with energy for a while and it took us maybe six to eight months to decide on February just because of how fast things have been moving. Um, and I think the whole purpose of today is to try to look on, on past experiences with open source in other industries and try to translate that into either recommended practices or just lessons learned and whatnot so that people in um, energy can look at these companies that came for the past 20 years before you, uh, whether in telecom, in mobile, in consumer electronics, in healthcare, um, and networking, and, and many other industries that went through that transformation and kind of learn from their experiences. Okay, and one, one interesting story, actually, last night uh, we had a small dinner uh, with some people from Aliander and RTE, and we all had kids. Okay, so we were talking about funny stories on how uh, we all, as parents, kind of try to limit Wi-Fi access to the kids, okay, in a way to force them to go fix your room and do the homework. So, you know, if you're not, I'm going to cut off the Wi-Fi until you go do your homework and things like that. And what's really interesting, and, and I was thinking about this earlier this morning when I woke up, is, you know, in, 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 you know, in my... My, I have a daughter, she's 12, and I tell her to go do her homework and fix her room. And she actually, you know, she has her room on the top floor, so she goes and she sends me a picture of her room. And it's perfect. I mean, everything is tidy, she's done her laundry, her bathroom is perfect. And I, after a few weeks, I realized she keeps sending me the same pictures. Okay. So, and then I decided to go upstairs, and the room was a mess. Okay. So the whole point... I mean, I'm telling you the story is, from today, is we're trying to share blind spots, okay? So, um, so you know, when your daughter sends you or your, your son sends you pictures of the room perfect, make sure that they're new pictures, okay? And, you know, we were taking that analogy in, uh, in, to open source is, you know, how can we look back at 20 years of professional enterprise experience um, in open source and try to learn from these companies? You know, when IBM started in 2000 announcing $1 billion investment in Linux, and then in 2011, $1 billion investment in open source cloud. You know, these are clues that we can look back and say, you know, how did they come to these decisions and how did they actually take that investment and translate it into actionable items and from there benefit their business. Okay, um, so um, there are a lot of uh, presentations, uh, a, a lot of kind of material to go through. A lot of it was created in December, so I created most of it between Christmas and New Year. So um, for the most of it, it's the first time I present it. And there are, there are some few sections coming up uh, that, that I've done before. So um, there are sections that are kind of focused on development. I don't know if there are software engineers here, but if you manage engineering people, uh, that would be great. Uh, there are sections focused on strategy, uh, section focused on leveraging value, sections focused on taking internal proprietary code and making it open source, the various steps. And I try to, to be as practical as possible. Um, so, and one of the big benefits of meetings like this, I have, in my opinion, is not the slides. Um, I think the, the highest value is people asking questions and trying to um, communicate and, and discuss the specific questions. Uh, you know, for me personally, I would be extremely happy to throw away all the slides and just um, have like an open uh, Q and A session, okay? So please don't be shy um, to you know to stand up and uh, and ask your questions. And as Shuri mentioned, if you don't want the question to be recorded, just please state that, and it will be excluded from the recording. Um, so with that, um, so I have some references. Um, all the slides from today will be posted on Energy, but uh, I will also post them on my GitHub and personal website, and if you go to GitHub or my personal website, there's uh, actually a lot of um, other material um, that you can use as a, as a reference. Uh, most of it was published by the Linux Foundation. 
Um, so it's, it's all, or you can go to the next formation website. <sighs> all right, so uh, we're starting with the slides. This is slide one of 728, I think. <laughs> no, I just kidding. <laughs> so, um, and again, so please stop and ask me any questions uh, because I think th this is, you know, more valuable than going through slides. So in open source, we talk a lot about upstream. Okay, uh, so it's it's a uh, it's uh, so so I start kind of in a way basic stuff and kind of ramp up from there, just to build kind of a common knowledge across all the people in, in the room. Uh, so upstream is reference to kind of the core open source project, which is either on GitHub or you know anywhere. You know, if, when, if you have a river, you have the upstream part of it, which is and this is from there where where all the code flows down to downstream users, which are different companies or individuals receiving that code and using with it. Um, so there's that, and then there's the verb to upstream, which is basically to take code and put it up there and make it open source and use it as kind of a base to build on. Um, so when you hear upstream, you know, think kind of primary source of a given open source project. Um, so motivations to contribute to upstream. So, the, so by the way, it was very hard to kind of come up with the right schedule on what material should I present in which order. Um, it's just really a difficult process, and I think as you go through the day, you realize that it's kind of challenging to figure out a good serial way of doing this. So um, I, I'm just starting from there, and then we'll see how, how it goes. Uh, motivations for contributing upstream, a lot of companies, um, and I cover that part of the strategy, figure out, you know, most companies start as users, okay? They st and it's usually bottom up, meaning developers, figuring out and discovering different components online, you know, on GitHub or SourceForge or different places, start consuming it, and then the management realizes that, hey, this is actually pretty good, it's benefiting us, we're able to recycle our old code, and then it moves from being um, a user, and then the company starts investing to become a participant, and then they become a contributor, and kind of the, the end goal is to target for leadership position in specific projects that are critical to uh, their services and products. Similar to people sitting in this room from the energy sector, uh, you will probably be investing in specific projects that you deem as critical for your product and services. And part of that investment is contributing engineering resources. So why companies do that? Why would you want to contribute and, and you know, influence a project? Because you use it, you rely on it. Uh, you want to make sure the project goes in a, a good direction that is uh, favorable to how you want it to go. Um, you want to attract external developers. You cannot ask people to participate in a project and you're kind of sitting watching and only using. Okay? Um, and um, basically grow that community and build an ecosystem around it, which is similar to what Chud is doing you know, as the umbrella of uh, energy. Uh, from my perspective, as a kind of very practical um, point of view, uh, I show you two case scenarios. One is development without upstreaming, meaning you download code from open source, use it internally, but you maintain it internally without taking your contributions back and putting it in the upstream project. Okay, and this is actually one of the very costly ways of working with open source. And so basically you have open source projects, uh, say version 1.1, you download it, you work on it, your, your developers and engineers uh, create special features, they do some integration work, and then um, it, it's tested, and then it's included in this is the product, okay? Um, and then in this scenario, if you don't take your contributions and try to contribute it back to the project and integrate it with the open source project, you have to repeat everything you've done for the next release. So when the open source project comes with version 1.2, you have to come back here and redo all of this for version 1.2 in addition to anything you want to add to 1.2. And this is what you call uh, technical debt. So basically you're creating that technical debt for your project anytime you don't upstream because you need to continue maintaining that old code separately from uh, the open source version. So in the other scenario, which kind of explains how it works with upstreaming, you download, you apply your custom patches, you test, and you push the code both to the product and to the upstream version. And then it, you work with the upstream version, meaning you work with open source developers, 
you know, other companies working on that project to integrate your um, code. And then the next time around, when version 1.2 of AppStream is available, your developers get it, and it already has your stuff. So you have very little technical debt uh, available. So from a very practical perspective, away from you know, fancy you know, benefits of working with AppStream, it impacts directly the cost of maintenance of code within your company. And this is well proven, and actually many companies um, have a policy called uh, upstream first policy, meaning unless otherwise decided, everything we do is going to be upstream. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this later on. So best practices um, internally to your organization. So there are kind of two parts. Internally, what do you do, and externally, and there are a lot of these best practices, and you'll probably be bored by the end of the day, because I'm going to say best practice a lot. Um, so in turn to your organization, upstream for the right reasons. Okay? Um, so there are a lot of reasons why you want to upstream, and there are also a lot of um, bad reasons. Okay? So uh, always choose what you want to upstream and for the good reasons, because trying to push code to open source project um, that is uh, maybe outdated, or it doesn't benefit anyone but you, or you know, different other reasons, um, will not gain you uh, kind of positive influence. It will actually fire back. So we always need to participate in a, in a positive way um, and participate for the right reasons versus uh, throwing code out there. Uh, design and implement code with upstreaming in mind. So when the developers internally to any given company are working on a project, um, you know, they have their own workflow, they, they also have the, their own way of uh, following coding practices and so on, which may be different from the open source project. Every open source project, they have different um, code policies, different ways of dealing with security vulnerability, different coding practices, and so on. So when trying to create code internally to the company that you want to push to, into the project, uh, we need to be mindful of these of the practices within the project. So when we take that code and push it into the into the op open source project, uh, we have much higher likelihood um, for acceptance uh, of the code. And keep the developers involved in open source projects. Um, you know, I, I've managed engineering teams as large as you know 600, 700 people, and in many cases, even though my engineers are not necessarily active in the project in terms of code. I actually want them to be on the mailing list and want them to be listening to or participating in IRC or whatever, you know, um, Slack or any kind of, kind, of, kind of live communication going on just to be updated on what's happening in the project. Uh, and it's also good intelligence, right? I mean, what's, what other companies are doing and what is our competitor pushing into the project because it gives us insights into their interest and what they're trying to do. Um, so when submitting code, um, some key points, ensure that contributions are useful to others. You know, if you try to submit code that is only useful to you, Aleander or RTE or so on, um, you, know, you, you will have some friction. It will not be accepted easily. So if the code you're trying to make available um, is easily understood and accepted as, hey, this is beneficial for not just the company making it available, but a lot of people, then it, the chances of accepting it is pretty high. Uh, follow proper coding code. I mentioned that earlier. Work within the submission processes for the project. Um, and every open source project is different, and they have different ways of accepting code. Uh, and my, my recommendation to my engineers is when they, or you know, our junior engineers who join us, is you know, join the mailing list, and for the first two, three months, you know, don't talk. <laughs> Just sit on the mailing list and on Slack or Glitter or the various tools and, and learn. See what um, how work happens, what's the workflow, uh, how people talk to each other, what are the priorities in the project, and learn the processes for the project because the way code is submitted to the Linux kernel is very different to code submitted to the Chrome browser, is very different to JStreamer, so every project is different. Uh, and your knowledge in one project doesn't mean a lot in another project. Uh, uh, provide documentation. You know, if you're planning to contribute, make sure that your contribution is documented, because your goal is to get others to to, to participate and and be part of uh, the contribution and, and help you maintain it. So they need to understand it. Uh, listen to feedback and act upon it. Uh, so when you submit, you're going to get feedback. Some of it is positive, some of it is not. Um, and what I tell people is always 
you know, focus on the feedback from a technical perspective, don't take anything personal. And kind of as a side story, um, I worked for Samsung for six years, and for and I also worked with a lot of Japanese and, and Chinese companies. And you know, if you are from Asia, if you are a software developer, and somebody tells you on the mailing list your code sucks, you have to go rewrite it. It's the end of the world for you, because your colleagues will see it, your manager will see it, and your career is over. Okay, so, so the, these countries actually went through maybe, we started working with Japan when I was at the Linux Foundation in the early 2000s. So they went through like a 15, 20 years cycle where now it is completely acceptable for you as a Japanese developer or a Chinese developer or a Korean developer to get negative feedback and your manager is not going to be upset with you and it's not going to fire you or reorg you to some dead project. Okay, so, uh, so some of the feedback may not be positive, but um, Remember, uh, feedback is always better than no feedback because it means that they read through it and they have something to say and you take it and you work with it. Uh, and be patient. Uh, a lot of the, uh, one of the common mistakes that engineering managers do in companies that are entering new to open source is they expect fast progress. So you take a piece of code, your engineer will contribute it to upstream and they expect you know, within one, two months, this will be part of the mainstream version. Uh, sometimes it takes six months, eight months, ten months, depending on the complexity and how this contribution affects other systems and so on. Uh, so always be, kind of be, be patient and be realistic about the time it takes to, to participate and, and to integrate your code as part of the overall community code. But remember, um, the goal, if you're focused on short term, you're not going to be happy with this, but always your goal is long term. You, know, you don't care about two months from now or five months from now but you care that you know, in, a, in a year and two years, you're not going to be maintaining that code anymore. And there's going to be other people participating and contributing to it. So always focus on, on the long term as well. So um, generic upstreaming process, this is just a sample process. Uh, it works in the same way in many projects. In other projects, they have variations of it, but this is just kind of for um, um, illustration purposes. Um, so internally to the company, you get the approval to to contribute whatever piece of code you're working on. Um, <clears throat> and um, one of the things that I've done in several companies I worked at and I keep doing with new companies coming in is help them figure out an easy process internally to the companies. So as many of you are kind of sitting and trying to, to enter the space, you will need to create internal processes, policies, support, all of that with specific tooling, have a committee that oversees the contribution, the compliance piece. So there's a lot of pieces involved. And uh, one of the things I'd like you to think about when it comes to contribution is to classify uh, the contributor, contribution type. Uh, so imagine if you ask every developer in your company to request approval for every contribution. So maybe in the first few months, it's not going to be a lot of work, but imagine when all of your developers are actually involved now in these projects. Um, you know, your lawyers, and you know, they will not like to get 500 emails every day because you're pushing 500 patches every day. Okay, so, uh, so one of the ways I, I would um, recommend is to classify contributions as you know, minor contribution, where developers are always free to submit you know, minor patches, you know, small fixes, you know, without any prior approval, and then you, you move into major uh, feature, uh, or you know, you can follow your own um, classification, and this only requires engineering manager approval. And then bigger pieces require also legal approval because maybe it's proprietary code that you're making available. And then the, the last piece is the largest, which is basically contributing a project, like to LF Energy, or contributing or launching a new project where it might require executive sign-off. So there are different ways that you can work to minimize the internal kind of bureaucracy around uh, these approvals. Anyhow, um, so this is on internal approval. Um, you know, plan your submission strategy. So imagine, um, you know, uh, I'll give you a real example. One of my development teams in the past was responsible for improvement to the um, uh, Linux kernel for better battery life on the phones, okay? So, uh, and, and these are kind of critical systems. We cannot just show up to the kernel mailing list and provide, you know, half a million lines of code 
or 100,000 clients, of course, you know. So there has to be a way that we can first inform the community of what we're planning to do, get their feedback, even before we write a single line of code. And then try to partition our submission and our contribution in ways that other can um, review and congest in a, in a reasonable way. So for major contribution, there has to be kind of a strategy behind it on how we're going to do it versus kind of, you know, small bits and pieces. Um, are there dependencies on private code? Uh, this is something you need to be mindful of. If you're contributing to, to a project and your contribution contains code that relies on other code that is not open source, that's not going to fly. Okay, so uh, that has to be fixed. Does it meet the project security um, and coding guidelines? So you, your engineers need to be aware of these guidelines so that they can respect them when they contribute code. Uh, and then prepare, prepare the code for submission. There are different ways uh, to do this. To, to, to do so, um, you know, make sure that you're using the latest upstream version, your patch applies to it, you respect the different guidelines and so on, and then submit it, okay? <laughs> and then start the feedback loop. Um, so, um, so there's kind of a lot of things that happen even before you submit the code. Uh, and then once you submit the code, then your interactions with the community will start there where they will provide feedback and you work with that. Um, so some characteristics, um, it's bottom-up development, um, so it's basically um, those who do the work get to say how things are done, so it's a lot of the work happens from engineering going up versus management um, stating, um, you know, giving orders and then developers uh, working on this. Uh, developers, uh, personal relationship is extremely important, uh, and this is why I, uh, Developers like to go to conferences and present and meet other developers because then when you're in the virtual world, you know, sitting on chat or sending emails to a mailing list with you know a few hundred to few thousand people on it, that personal connection you make, you make at a conference is extremely valuable. Um, and um, you know, on that as a side note, um, one of the feedback we get in the Linux Foundation about our event is that people value what we call the hallway venue or the hallway track. So basically there is multiple tracks in the conference and there's the hallway where people hang out outside. This is the most valuable track in the conferences where people get to talk outside of an actual presentation. Uh, re release early and often. Uh, so this is actually a very famous mot um, in, motto in open source. Um, typically in companies we wait to, to have something working very well, it's, it's perfect in our eyes, and then we want to make it available then. But in, in open source, as, as soon as you have something, you should make it available, because the whole goal is to make others be part of it and have them feel ownership with you so that they can feel that this, they're part of the process and then they want to contribute and be part of this with you. Uh, so don't wait until you have a full working version. So if you have a feature you're implementing, you want to provide it to one of the projects in Enough Energy, don't wait till the end to make it available. As soon as you start working on it, share the idea, get feedback on it, and share the code as you progress. And this is how you, you'll be able to pick up followers and pick up people who will help you contribute to it. Peer review. Um, so peer review is one of really, really strongest features in open source, where you submit a feature, you submit code, and you have people actually reviewing it and giving you feedback on it. Um, and it's quite interesting because in many of the companies I worked at, we relied more on peer review in open source than peer review inside the teams. So when we review code internally, um, people don't spend as much time on it. So internally, when we submit uh, code to open source, we see the peer review in open source as really more valuable in terms of outcome than the peer review we do internally because actually people slack internally. And, um, don't do it. In open source, it's actually quite a respected um, pro uh, practice. Small incremental changes. Uh, I think I mentioned this earlier. You know, when you submit something to open source, don't submit big stuff. Uh, people need to understand what you're submitting, understand the changes that happened between this version and what happened, what came before it. So it's, it has to be easy to understand. And it's, because of that, it has to be small. And it's also a lot easier to test smaller increments of code than to test um, bit large uh, amounts of code. Uh, new features uh, should be small and non-intrusive. So if you're planning a feature that you want to push that touches on multiple subsystems, it requires a lot of planning because then you need to talk to multiple maintainers, multiple developers. 
And uh, if your feature has some security flaw, it will be ignored until you actually fix that. So um, open source developers in general are very sensitive to security, so um, you need to have your own due diligence done on security um, of, and the implications of possible security of the code that you're submitting. Um, it's a distributed development. I think you all know that by now. Um, developers are sitting everywhere. Um, and this is actually not just specific to open source. You know, I, wor you know, I worked in multiple companies, and um, many of the developers I worked with and many of the developers that were on my team are, were actually in, in, in different countries, uh, different time zones, uh, different cultural background, different technology background, and so on. Um, and we'll touch a little bit on this as part of kind of the inner sourcing. Um, but basically, um, people sit everywhere in resource development. Um, and um, um, basically, um, it's a really fascinating environment uh, to work with. Um, it has a diverse contributor base. Some people are paid by companies. Some people work on project because they like the project. They're personally invested in it. They use it, you know, it's just their hobby. Um, and um, you can be sitting on the mailing list and working on a project and with your top five commercial competitors, and this is totally fine, okay? So I worked, I worked at Motorola and uh, on, on Linux devices, and we were working with our competitors, uh, commercial competitors, every day, um, but within the context of Linux and within the context of open source. Right? And um, the reason I'm kind of highlighting this to you is in energy, you may be sitting with, uh, you know, I think Arjun at the beginning, you know, he showed the map of the blue section where Aliander provides power, right? But there were other sections in other colors, and these are, I assume, our competitor in a sense. No? Okay. But, but basically, uh, you know, I, I'll give another example, okay? Uh, you know, at Samsung, we had LG, you know, Huawei. You know, Google, of course, because they do their own devices, Motorola, you know, Sony, you know, all these consumer electronics. But uh, they're our competitor. They, they sell similar products. We compete with them day in and day out. But our open source developers and our developer work with the developers every single day. So we had thousands of developers uh, focused on the open source side, working with the competitors' developers every day on non differentiating components. So no one goes and buys. Uh, you know, a cell phone, whether it's Samsung or anything else, because it has Linux on it, right? So why should we not collaborate with others on such a basic piece of code um, that is not differentiating to us, right? And this is kind of the mindset where we collaborate on the infrastructure on or what you call kind of plumbing pieces, and then the that's, that can be up to 80% of the stack, and then the 20% is your own differentiating. This is where you bring in your own value. And this applies pretty much to any um, industry. So if you look at consumer electronics, that's the case. If you look at automotive, so you have BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Toyota, Nissan, uh, Range Rover, Jaguar, all these companies working as part of the uh, automotive initiative in the Linux Foundation, collaborating on um, uh, automotive-grade Linux and it's a complete stack, and they, they take it, they all use it. So if you're driving a BMW or Mercedes, 80% of the software running the car is actually the same. And it's just mostly the UI and special services that are offered by the specific company. So this is a mindset where we collaborate on everything below our value line, and on top of that, we just focus on our innovation there. Um, open source developers uh, are spread across the world. We already know that. Uh, and the reason I mentioned this here again is basically um, mailing list is, you know, participation on mailing list, on chat. Um, and there are different software, so, so please ignore the specific. Um, it's, it's extremely important. <clears throat> and one of the challenges I had personally, and I'm mentioning this, is basically to, to give you, to kind of give you a heads up of blind spots is, a lot of the companies I worked at, especially Asian companies, um, have a lot of firewalling rules. So you cannot connect to chat, for example, right? Uh, and this basically cuts your developers from the rest of the world when it comes to live discussions versus emails. Um, so uh, we will talk a little bit about this 
uh, from an IT perspective on things you need to do to enable your developers. Because if you want to have an internal su successful open source development team, they need to be able to use the same tools and infrastructure and, and uh, build systems and so on as the ones used by their peers in other companies. And if you're not able to provide that, they will not have the proper environment to drive your ag technical agenda with the open source projects. I think I covered that too. So, uh, the, uh, so there's IRC, there's Glitter, there's Slack, there's different, you know, it depends on the project. So uh, that's why I mentioned, you know, it's not just these, so it depends on a project by project basis. Um, so project hierarchy, most projects follow this hierarchy where you have the top level maintainer um, and you have subsystems and you have um, different category of developers. Some of them are committers, some of them are just basic contributors. So uh, at the bottom, you have the developers, and this is kind of typically where your developers would start. They start contributing, and then if they become uh, famous, and what, what, what famous means is if, if they have good uh, history of contributions, a good quality of contributions, and they're consistent over a, a long period of time, that can be you know, six, eight, 12 months, then they have the opportunity to, be, to become promoted and become by the community members and become kind of a maintainer of a system or a larger maintainer. And this is extremely important because it, it gives, you know, the maintainer have kind of a holistic view on all the project and they have to approve all the incoming patches. So it's kind of a, a very good position to be in. Um, so it's kind of vertically tight. And of course, the levels um, depend on the project. Small projects have only one maintainer. Everybody else is... A, is a, is a contributor. A uh, large, complex project, um, I mentioned the Linux kernel. This, this applies to the Linux kernel. You have um, you know, the top level, which is Greg Crow Hartman. Then you have about 100 subsystems, you know, power systems, power subsystem, files, um, memory file system, file systems, subsystem, and, and, and so on. So there, it's a really complex um, project. And then uh, there's also the concept of committer. A committer is somebody who can submit code to the project and their submission is um, accepted without review just because they are trusted and they have a long history of uh, good contribution and high quality contribution. Uh, um, um, small incremental changes, uh, so all changes come from the bottom and, and, and kind of make them their way up. Uh, and uh, meritocracy drive uh, acceptance. So. If you're good, you advance in the project. And if your contributions are not good, you're not going to advance. So it's 100% it's meritocracy based. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you know the developers, the maintainers, you have good relations with them. That, all of that doesn't matter. What matters is the code. And that's why we say code is king. I don't know if you've heard that before. Um, but code is king. Good, good code um, will, will get you places. Uh, so this is a small project. Um, I'm just giving you a few examples, okay? Uh, you know, small projects, um, you know, most of them, they have just a single maintainer, and, you know, there's no specific date for the releases. So they can release when they're ready. You know, there's not high pressure, not a lot of people in the project. And typically, they have a single body of code, you know, not, not a large body of code. Uh, for kind of medium-sized projects, you can have a maintainer, maybe you one level of subsystems. You, know, you have the top maintainer and a few subsystems, uh, and e each man subsystem maintainer is responsible for a specific body of code. Uh, and then, as the project grows, um, you know, they have a more predictable release schedule. Why? Because the community is larger, and people now depend on the project. So you cannot depend on a project as a, for your product if you don't know when the, the project will release, because your product depends on the release, and you cannot just be uh, waiting, right? So, so the, the criteria because b becomes uh, stronger when it comes to releases. And of course, for really large projects, like the projects we run at the found Linux Foundation, um, there are different levels of maintainers, just because the code is so complex, and there are m multiple parties involved. Uh, and, you know, f for the same project, there may be contribution from coming from multiple companies. So you have maintainers coming from different uh, companies as well. And then each release um, releases, there are release dates. So in LFAI, which is the foundation I run, 
uh, the cadence for our project is, is six months. So every six months we have a new release. So it's predictable. We have release management and companies wait for us to release our projects and then they can take them and incorporate them in their project and go through that cycle. So as, as the project grows, it becomes run more like a product within a company. Okay. Uh, the decision process in open source is kind of very different from, um, from a company. You know, in a company, you have engineering VP or director, and we're going to do this and this, and everybody follows. Okay. Um, decisions are decentralized in open source, uh, and uh, it's run on a trust system. Um, not all decisions need to be done by delegates. It's basically people with the most technical expertise that kind of drive the work. And this is why we emphasize the need of putting engineers on projects, have them learn, grow, and become maintainers, because this is how you can exercise influence and you can build expertise in any given project. And because of the decentralized nature, you know, people living in different countries, working for different companies, um, using different tools and so on, uh, that drives the need for extra transparency. So everybody knows you know, who's working on what, all discussions are public, uh, and people are accountable. So if you say, I'm going to deliver this, you know, you're going to be accountable for it, and, um, and it's, all of that work is visible to everybody. Uh, not necessarily only within the project, but visible at a, at a global level. Anyone can just go and see it. Um, and everything is documented. So all the discussions are recorded, you know, you know, and, you know, mailing lists are, are saved and so on. So, you know, 10 years later, you can just go back and figure out what happened in that project. Uh, influence is based on reputation. And of course, reputation doesn't translate from one project to another. So you may have um, developers working on um, one given open source project and their top maintainers, excellent reputation. Then you decide to transfer these individuals who work on another project. Now, their, rep re their reputation doesn't transfer. So now they go to a new project and they start from the bottom. They're just like a basic contributor. And then they need to build up their expertise and their contribution to, to become a committer and maintainer. Um, so, um, uh, you know, um, that translates, you know, that's very different from a commercial world where you know, I was working for HP, and then Samsung uh, hired me, and you know, I came in at better level, right? You know, so if you're a software engineer at one company, another company desires to hire you, they maybe give you a, a raise and a better position. But in open source, no, you start always. You come in and you start from the bottom until you prove yourself, and then you become worthy of the trust to become a committer and maintainer. Uh, so the writer, the person who writes the best code has the most influence um, given. Um, and uh, behavior is very important. Um, you know, th there was this caricature in the past where you have a dog in front of a computer and he's chatting on a dating site and he says, nobody knows I'm a dog. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. So, so basically, when people are sitting behind a computer and they don't interact with, you know, in real life, uh, you know, um, behavior becomes extremely important because it's the only way people know you through mailing list and chat. Uh, so it's very important to be, you know, very respectful and provide um, tangible um, and actionable feedback on the code, and and to explain, you know, why because that's the only way people can actually take the, the you know the feedback and and, and work on it. Um, uh, I mentioned accountability, so people take responsibility for their code. Um, unlike large companies where and I worked at some, and you know where people do stuff, and then they kind of disappear within the hierarchy of the company of 100,000 people. Um, in open source, it's very transparent, so you, there's a lot of scrutiny on code, where your code's coming from, who did it, is it good, you know, you know all these questions. So the end result, or the desired end result, is high quality code, and this is what's driving a lot of that. Um, anonymous contributions are universally not accepted. Uh, so you will see a lot of, um, you know, in the old days, you could have, you know, uh, Rick85 at hotmail.com, you know, contributing. You know, that was maybe the case 20 years ago, but now contributions coming from anonymous email addresses are not really accepted. Okay. 
So people, for the project to accept your contribution, they need to know who you are um, and to have kind of a, a real email address versus kind of a bogus one that, you know, sleepycat85, whatever, at gmail.com. Um, uh, and, and that's also for compliance reasons, you know. Um, how can we tell, we need to be able to, to, to keep track of the lineage of code. So we need to make sure that code is not, uh, you know, that the person submitting the code has actually the right to submit that code on behalf of their company if they were an employee, or they actually wrote the code themselves and they didn't copy it from somewhere else and, and things like that. Um, and uh, what's really interesting is actually uh, a lot of companies, uh, including some I worked at in the past, require that the, their employees um, use their company email address to submit contributions when they're working in open source on behalf of the company. So a lot of open source developers, they have their hobby projects as well. And for their own hobby project, they can use their personal email address. But uh, for company-related open source projects, companies require that the employee uses the company ID. And um, that also allows the company to go to GitHub or to the build systems or BitKeeper or whatever the code is being uh, done and survey, you know, how much code are we contributing from our company. And you can do that by committer ID, which is the email address. So it gives you a good way to track what's coming out of your company in terms of contribution size relative to everybody else and that kind of statistics. But if, if people use their personal email addresses, then it becomes very difficult to track that. Um, so please feel free to stop me anytime for questions. Okay, I'm, I feel a lot of pressure because there's a lot of content and I'm trying to be a little bit um, kind of moving with, with the content. Uh, so peer review, oh, sorry, go ahead. Hi, my name is Janneke uh, van der Westlaken, working for Robert Bosch GmbH in Germany. Um, from, for the legal department, to be honest. And personally, I really do see the benefits and the values of open source contribution. I really think it, it's helpful. But I also experience a lot of hesitation, maybe even skepticism. But I don't know, is it fear of the unknown or is it uh, maybe the copy left ghost that kind of haunts I don't know but I, I was looking for some um, arguments some some um, to give them better understanding why it could be um, a good decision on some point whether or not to upload the uh, uh, to upstream a code mm -hmm. so given some arguments uh, and and of course I understand what you tell me and I'm really I already was convinced but how do we uh, get the others uh, to, to take into consideration that upstream might be a, a very good decision as well. Thank yeah. you. So, uh, there are actually multiple arguments for this. Um, so, there is the, the kind of the obvious technical argument, which is the cost of maintenance of code. And I've experienced that firsthand where I was working in a company and at one point for one graphics component, we had to maintain 600,000 lines of code uh, internally because there was really no way for us to make that available because nobody's going to digest that. Uh, but I think from a, at least from a legal perspective, um, you know, from a legal point of view, it's risk management. Okay? And uh, you know, if, if you go back to year 2000, so at year 2000, I was working for Ericsson Research, not very far from here in Stockholm, and um, and um, the, the the first report I created at uh, um, at Ericsson Research was what is the Linux and what is the GNU GPL in uh, I think March or April of year 2000. Okay. And back then, and I'm kind of, this is not a direct answer, but I'll get to the direct answer. I, I'm just giving some context. And, and, and back then, everybody was, uh, you know, GPL is, you know, quote unquote, a cancer, and we should stay, uh, uh, you know, away from it, and it's a nightmare, and, you know, and, and all of that. You know, then we went through the cycle. You know, there was some education. You know, companies started to, uh, to identify, okay, it's not as bad. 
we need to understand the license, we need to understand the license obligation. If you use this code, what, what do we have to give in return based on the licenses? And today, you know, if you look at the, the companies, you know, if you look at Samsung or any of the companies, and I, I'm going to give a lot of Samsung examples because I was there for six years and they're kind of fresh examples. Um, a lot of the code we use and is used in the industry is actually GPL code, which is, you know, copy left. And, but, you know, what, what happened, you know, 20 years ago and today, multiple things happened. One, there's a better understanding of the licenses and the licensing regime as a whole. There's much more sophisticated compliance programs. So in the past, you know, in year 2000, when I was with, with Ericsson, we didn't know what was a compliance program. I mean, it wasn't a thing. Uh, same thing, you know, there was no open source program office. We were called Open Systems Lab because we create systems and we do R&D, so it's a lab and it's open because we use open source, you know. So, so, so there has been a lot of advances in, in um, understanding licenses. There has been some ad major advances in compliance. So companies now set up pro processes internally. They have policies. There are a lot of uh, tool providers and open source tool that allows you to to control the you know um, the life cycle of the code and also allows you to uh, identify the incoming licenses and the origin of the code so there has been a lot of um, progress in, in these different fronts to a point today where um, GPL is actually well understood in a sense and there's actually in several companies I worked at it's actually on the whitelist where whitelist meaning engineers can use GPL code uh, without any issue. Okay, the GPL v2, GPL v3 is a different story. Okay, so, um, and, and th that whole thing is, when you look at it, it's about managing risk. And it's not any different from uh, getting software from a commercial vendor. Say you work with, I don't know, Oracle or, or Microsoft and they give you code, under uh, their end user license agreement, uh, you have to be careful how your engineers use that code and integrate it with your product. Open source is not any different. Um, it's, it's the same thing, except it's different kind of licenses and, and, and so on. So, um, so I think with good compliance infrastructure, you know, a policy, a process, a, you know, a policy, and, and for me, a policy is just one line. You know, any, co any code coming into the company need to be uh, approved and any code um, leaving the company uh, need to be reviewed and approved. Right? Just very basic. How do you do that is the process. And the process is, um, you know, provide um, a request or, you know, request the approval for using or contributing, scan the source code, identify the, the, the license and the origin of the code, and have people stamp approve it, you know, product team, legal, and engineering, and it's out. And all of that, all of these actions minimizes any kind of risk that you may have in the future. Was this? Yeah. yeah? Yeah. So, so I think in terms of argument for upstreaming, I, I will give you, you know, the argument I always used, and it, it's very simple. And, uh, I like simple things, you know, um, and I think I have a chart in the future. You know, in a few hours, maybe <laughs> six hundred. So, you know, so I have a. So, I, as the leader of uh, Samsung uh, Open Source Division, every year, and we are a, a cost center, right? We're not a PNL. So, I have every year to go and, and fundraise money. Okay, and it's a it's a painful exercise, especially when you're talking kind of not few hundred thousands. We're talking you know large millions of dollars for a really large team. Um, and I, I, I have one slide which showcases um, our product. And I had about maybe 40 different Samsung product on the chart. Okay, everything from printer to computer to cell phones to home appliances, uh, router, I mean, you name it, everything. And uh, I used to do that as a tricky question. So I would have a much smaller audience, maybe, you know, seven, eight people, you know, including, you know, my supervisors, people from finance and so on. And I would put the slide and I say, can you, I ask them as part of the budget discussion, uh, I always do a presentation and then we talk budget after. I say, can you please identify how many of these products uh, use open source? And it's a tricky question because it's all of them. 
And they try to say, oh, you know, 20 out of 40, you know, you know they try to give a number, but the numbers are, and, and we're always wrong, because it's 100% of our products uh, rely on open source, and then the percentages vary between, you know, 25 up to 80%. So if you, if you pick a random product out of the slide, it's at least 25% of the code is open source, and in some cases up to 80%. And the 80%, we're talking a little over 1,000 open source components. Okay. So, so when you're dealing with that, um, um, th then my follow-up is, okay, should we rely on open source projects in our products that are driven by you know, our competitors, or should we take a leadership uh, approach to this and get involved in this project and neutralize the, you know, the effect of the fact that there are competitors influencing these projects for their own products and be part of the process and try also to push for uh, kind of a technical direction that will not necessarily help the competitor but also help us, right? And I think this, this is kind of a very powerful um, argument because um, a lot of the companies' leadership that i worked with in the past are not necessarily open source expert or even software expert. They, they just care about, you know, margins and product getting out of, you know, on time and, you know, releases like that. And w once we explain how the open source development happens and, and so on, then they have a much better picture. And, and one of the things I actually recommend is education. And, and education is like peer education, you know, you know, across, you know, on the same level with people like us. And then downward to, to all the way to developers, and then upwards. You know, I, you know, we ha we have to educate our leadership. You know, on, on why we have to do this. So, and, and this is a process. I mean, it takes um, a lot of time. But but I think going kind of back to 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 the question, um, you know, we have companies today. You know, multi-billion-dollar companies, all the tech companies. If you look at, uh, at Silicon Valley, where actually these companies would not exist if there was no open source. I mean, period. I mean, Google was built on open source. Facebook was built on for open source. Twitter was built on open source. Microsoft now is like the biggest open source cheerleader. I mean, you know, and they're not doing it because it's fun and you know because their engineers like it. They do it because it helps their products. Um, It always surprises me that companies are apparently um, willing to accept the most scariest end-user license agreements uh, concerning proprietary software, and then when it comes to open source, they say, oh no, it's open source, we cannot accept that. And it's just surprising. <laughs> yeah, but I think that it's a cycle. I mean, you know, you know, 15 years ago, Microsoft said Linux or open source was a cancer, I think, or something like that. And now they're like the, a, a large, you know, significant contributor to you know, they are a member of the Linux Foundation, they are on our board, they are on the board of CNCF and many other foundations, and, uh, you know, it's, so they went through that cycle and they came to realize that, okay, collaborative development is very beneficial to us and we don't have all the smartest people in the world and we need to figure out a way to work with other smart people and open source is that vehicle that allows you um, to, to, to enable that kind of collaboration. Continue. Uh, okay. So continuous development, testing, and integration. So again, we're talking about some, some of the characteristics. Um, there's no separation between implementation, integration, and testing. It's like ongoing. And it's actually to a point where at the Linux Foundation, we even launched early uh, of last year, CD Foundation, Continuous Delivery Foundation. And we host multiple projects uh, within that domain that allow um, that kind of cycle to happen. So. Um, there are so many benefits to this approach. Uh, I will not go deeper uh, in deeper details, but it's basically it allows you to discover errors uh, fairly quickly. Um, projects, of course, every project is different, but most of open source, if not all of it, follows you know um, the cycle where people submit code, it gets tested directly, applied to the latest upstream branch, uh, errors show up, fix them. So it's kind of very cyclic from that perspective. Um, release early and often, I think we covered this. Uh, overlapping release cycle, so most projects have that. Um, you don't necessarily, I, I mentioned also in LFAI, uh, most of our projects have a cadence of six months. Uh, you know, major release every six months. So that, that is kind of 
the, the, the large release. But of course, there are releases every day. So every day, because we're doing continuous integration and delivery, um, every day you can have a fresh release that you can take out and deploy or test with. Um, so there are some daily builds, there are weekly builds, and then there's like the official release every six months. Um, and, and this is great because it, it allows you to see progress, it allows you to, uh, uh, to see new code coming in, where it's coming, how it's impacting, how it's being tested. Um, so great visibility into the project. Uh, code is modular. Uh, modularity helps, helps on scale. Um, and that's why basically when I showed the hierarchy of projects, you see a lot of subsystem. And this is a great characteristic of open source development where it's not all like one big blob of code. It's all different compartments doing different things with APIs and interfaces. Uh, and it, it allows you to scale uh, and allows maintainers really to, to have a good understanding of their area without having to learn really everything else. So uh, I think uh, this is kind of the, the first section. Um, I think the, the takeaway I'd, I'd like to leave you with is to adopt and follow an upstream first uh, philosophy. Uh, and actually if, even I think if you go to search engine and you type in upstream first or um, something of that sort, you will actually get links to a lot of information about this where it's actually uh, different companies adopted this, um, um, this approach. You know, if, if we're developing with open source, our approach is any kind of development we do on open source component, we, sh we just contribute it back. Um, and what's really interesting is I think in November 2019, so maybe two months ago, um, there was a major event in, in New York for the finance industry. So um, this is a conference where you have all the bank, investment banks, uh, traders, you know, come together and very similar to energy, but it's, you know, focused on finance um, and talk open source. And um, one, one very interesting remark I'd like to convey to you um, is one of the major banks in the US announced that 80% of their employees are software engineers. Now? Okay. So, so there's, they're going, they've been going through that transformation for about two years now. And they realized that actually the most critical component in terms of HR and, and resources is engineers. So, the, you know, it, it's not traders and it's, it's not kind of you traditional bankers. It's the people who create you know, what you don't see when you go to a bank or when you visit the bank website and so on. So 80% of one of the large, top five largest institu banking institutions in the US, 80% of their employees are, are developers. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, five years from now, if we meet again, I, I want to ask you the question, you know, how many, what's the percentage of engineers in your organization? And most likely it's going to be a lot more than what it is today. And, um, and the second, kind of observation uh, was um, some of the companies have already adopted this and um, they actually were speaking about it. They were speaking on um, how they did it. And so the event was called Open Source uh, Strategy Forum, I think. It's done by uh, a foundation called Finos, F-I-N-O-S. And all the presentations are public, so you can actually go and, and see that. And this is an industry that is maybe two years behind you. I mean, it's not that. That, that far in history. And uh, the third last observation, just before we take a one minute break, is um, nobody is special. And I told them, I, I, I had the presentation at the conference. Um, you know, the finance people think, oh, we are highly regulated. You know, we're finance and, you know, we're special. And I'm like, you're not special, okay? Um, nobody is special. Back in the early 2000s, telecom companies, you know, Ericsson, Nokia, Cisco, Juniper, Alcatel, you know, Nortel existed by then. You know, you know, all these companies, this, when they started taking open source and building their um, teleco grade systems and, and so on, they thought they're special. They're like, you know, we're special, we're regulated, you know, we, people need to make a 911 call, you know, the emergency, call the ambulance, you know, we cannot just use random open source, the copy left this. And, you know, th three, four, four years later, the, f the first round of products started to come in, and today, you know, 15, 20 years later, 
<laughs> every product coming out of this company for the infrastructure is actually open source or built on open source code. Then the mobile industry came in, and they're like, we, you know, we're special. We cannot just put open source in the hand of people. You know how that's going to work, and you know there are a lot of things. And today, uh, Linux-based smartphones are the largest, maybe, um, um, are the largest uh, phones sold in the world. There's like, you know, a few million phones activated every single day on Android. Just you know, uh, and then uh, multiple industries followed. You know, whether it's you know, you know, if you think of technology sector, you know, um, the cloud, today AI, you know, we have the AI foundation, there is um, efforts in healthcare, there's effort in governments, you know, you know and so on and so on. I'm, I'm actually, I'm scheduled to speak to the EU parliament in March, right? So, you know, the EU parliament is actually extremely interested about open source and AI. So, uh, you know, governments and so on. So, all of that to say is, you know, don't think of yourself as, you know, a special case. You know, a lot of industries came be came before you and went through that. Um, it's just software, um, and it's it's. There's no way for any single company of you to go and 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 hire all the smart people out there. And you need to figure out a way to work with them on things that are non-critical to your to your value system. And that is where open source comes in, where it allows you to. Forget your commercial interest in some cases. Uh, I mean, the energy sector is kind of special from this way, but um, and then sit down and, and, and identify areas where you can collaborate and produce it, and all of you can build on this. And if you know, if if car companies can do this, that compete to sell. You know, do you want to buy a BMW or a Mercedes or a Nissan or a Jaguar or you know all these? Um, you know, all of these companies, they compete day in and day out, but at the end of the day, they sit down and they build together the 80% of the software stack in the car. If they're able to do it, you can definitely, <laughs> you know. So, um, so this is kind of the first section. Uh, maybe we take a couple minutes break, um, and then uh, we start the second one. And, and please feel free to ask questions. I think the questions, is, for me, is the really important stuff. <laughs>